What's up, heathens? How ya doing? As you guys may know, this week I had a debate, a live in-person debate with uh, Lawrence Tisdall, and we were discussing the topic of uh, whether or not intelligent design is the best explanation for the diversity of life here on Earth. Now, in my debate, the opening statement was not all that great, uh, at least in my performance. I think that I have a very solid opening statement, and that's why I wanted to put this out here, because I wanted my opening statement without it being cluttered by my performance mistakes, my performance anxiety, and, you know, just all of the performance stuff surrounding my opening statement. I just, I wanted it out here uh, in, in a good way so that people could hear my actual argument. I hope that you're interested in this. I hope you're interested in my point about how intelligent design is not science and therefore cannot be the best explanation for the diversity of life. Hope you're interested in it. If you are, please stay tuned. All right, now we are going to tackle this particular question in a multitude of ways, none of which are going to be favorable to intelligent design. First, science is defined as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Basically, Science helps us describe reality the best that we can. This description of reality allows us to explain phenomena, but also predict them. The only way for something to be an explanation for some phenomenon, it has to not only be able to describe it, but also give us accurate predictions about the phenomenon. That being the case, any explanation that hopes to be the best explanation must also be a scientific explanation. If it's not a scientific explanation, then it can't describe the reality that we live in. So what is the intelligent design hypothesis, if we can even call it that? To quote the Discovery Institute, the theory of intelligent design holds that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection. So is this a scientific explanation? No, certainly not. In science, explanations for phenomenon have to include all of the current data that we have about that phenomenon. It must also be able to make accurate predictions about future data. Intelligent design doesn't make sense of any naturalistic phenomena. It appeals to a causative agent that can neither be tested nor observed. We can't make predictions about it. You see, in science, processes are mechanistic. We know how they work now and how they'll work in the future, as well as how they've worked in the past. If these processes did not work in this fashion, then stuff like cell phones, trains, automobiles, computers, none of that would work as we know it. Our world would look very different if that simple principle didn't hold true. Where are the experiments and observations of a designer meddling with natural processes? When intelligent designers propose that a designer crafted the bacterial flagellum, how can we test that? They just claim that irreducible complexity is an observation that proves a designer, but irreducible complexity has never been verified or stood up to scrutiny by researchers. You can't say that the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex for a multitude of reasons. For one, we've been able to mutate or delete proteins from the bacterial flagellum, and the bacterial flagellum didn't go away. It only affected how much motility the bacteria had. The bacterial flagellum most likely evolved through a single gene duplicating over and over again. This is just one example of how intelligent design fails to provide any kind of explanation for natural phenomenon. It also doesn't provide us with a prediction about anything. The eye isn't irreducibly complex either. We can trace the development of the eye in extant creatures today because Every step of the evolution of the eye is currently right now being used by some life form on this planet. But even if we didn't have the explanation for how a biological structure came to be, it would be a monumental jump in logic to say that a designer is the only explanation to account for it. It only means that our current explanation is unable to account for the structure. 
Me failing to account for some biological structure doesn't mean that intelligent design is right by default. Any natural explanation that we can posit is going to be so much more likely than a supernatural explanation, which is what intelligent design is at its core. It's a supernatural answer to natural questions. Let's see if intelligent design can explain or predict anything about the giant and red panda's thumb. Their thumb is a six pseudo digit that is actually a modified version of the radial sesamoid. How can intelligent design explain this feature? The best that intelligent design can say is that, oh, the designer just wanted to create it this way. But that's not really an explanation for anything. I mean, if there is an intelligent designer that's creating everything from scratch, then they would have the ability to just create the morphology that they wanted instead of modifying pre-existing structures. Because it would appear that the designer in this case just chose to modify the radial sesamoid in order to make some sort of pseudo-digit. You could also say that the designer just took the blueprint for one uh, animal, copied it, and changed it a little bit. But again, this is not an explanation for anything. It's just an illogical special pleading argument. There are genetic and physiological similarities between several different animals that allow us to connect them in an evolutionary chain that removes the need for a designer. Now, evolution would predict that giant red pandas have a common ancestor at some point in the past. And then, for whatever reason, they evolved this six pseudo-digit to help them survive better. And this is exactly what we find in reality. The red and giant pandas have a common ancestor about 40 million years ago. And then, due to the fact that their diet is primarily composed of bamboo, they developed a six pseudo-digit to help them eat better and survive. Let's take a look at something else that intelligence design can explain, but it hits a little bit closer to home. Taxonomically, we are classified as great apes, which also consist of orangutans, gorillas, and chimps. One of the reasons we know this is because of chromosome 2. You see, the other great apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes, while we only have 23 pairs. How does intelligent design account for this discrepancy? Well, ID could say, oh, the designer created apes and humans differently. But that doesn't explain what we actually observe in chromosome 2. Because what we actually observe in chromosome 2 is that the genetic banding of chromosome 2 matches two separate chromosomes in other apes. Chromosome 2 also has two centromeres, with one of them being inactive. And finally, there's this thing in chromosomes called telomeres, which are repeating DNA sequences that only appear at the ends of chromosomes. But in chromosome 2, they appear in the middle of the arm. You see, evolution can easily account for this, because we can explain it with a simple end-to-end -end fusion of two chromosomes in apes to get our chromosome 2. How would intelligent design explain this? It can't explain this with anything other than, well, that's how the designer wanted to do it. And that's not an explanation for anything. If that's what the designer wanted to do, then they have designed everything without any kind of indication that they did so. Eventually, this line of reasoning ends up trying to guess the designer's design philosophy and goals. Which is something none of us can know. It's a dead end. And this same problem applies to all features that ID proponents claim to be designed. In order to say that the hypothesis that the designer created feature X is more likely than feature X arose in some other way, the ID proponent has to make assumptions about the designer's design philosophy and goals. If the designer really wanted to create feature X, then they may have an argument. But if the designer didn't want to create feature X, then it's very unlikely that the designer would have created feature X. You see, without knowing the intentions of the designer, we can't really determine whether or not Feature X was designed by a designer or not. If we can't know the intentions of the designer, then intelligent design can't be an explanation for anything. This is true even if we grant the premise that a being or beings exist that can perform this type of creation. If such a being exists and their design preferences run counter to the life that we see here on Earth, then it's very unlikely that that designer designed that life. Without knowing their intentions, the very best that we can say is that 
Intelligent design may or may not be a viable explanation. Now, what about predictions? Does intelligent design make any kind of predictions? No, intelligent designers fail at answering basic questions about the predictable nature of their hypothesis. How was the bacterial flagellum designed? When was it designed? How many design events have occurred in the past? If intelligent designers can't answer these questions, how can they expect to make any predictions about the future? Using evolution, for example, we can explain a morphological gap between fish and tetrapods in the fossil record. And then we can use that to predict where and when we should be able to find a transitional fossil. And that's exactly what happened with Tiktaalik. With Tiktaalik, we were able to guess what layer of strata the fossil would be in and where in the world we should expect it. Can intelligent design make any similar predictions? No, because it doesn't account for the history of life on Earth. So it can't predict any kind of findings of this nature. If we find a transitional form, then ID says, well, the designer wanted to create that particular organism. If we don't find a transitional fossil, it's Oh, the designer chose not to create that organism. There's no real explanatory power there. ID cannot be considered an explanation for anything because it fails to meet the very basic requirements of an explanation. It fails to describe, explain, or predict phenomena in our reality. While intelligent design isn't a viable option for the diversity of life here on Earth, there is a process that's been studied for well over a century. That is evolution. Evolution operates by mutations and recombination, creating genetic variation in a population, followed by a number of mechanisms, including natural and sexual selection, genetic drift, and gene flow, acting on that population. Each of these mechanisms has been studied for at least decades and has been characterized in specific mathematical terms. Nothing like that exists in intelligent design. So that's it. Intelligent design cannot account for the diversity of life here on Earth, mainly because it is not a scientific idea. And as I laid out previously, the explanation has to be a scientific idea in order for it to provide actual predictions and descriptions of reality. We also discussed how ID fails to provide any kind of description, explanation, or predictions about the diversity of life that we have here now on Earth. Whereas we already have a process that's been vetted, that's been put through the scientific process, that is shown to give us actual explanations for why and how things work. A process that has been rigorously studied across different platforms. And that's evolution. Evolution is the best explanation for the diversity of life here on Earth. And that's because it's a scientific explanation and not a supernatural one. Thank you, heathens, for uh, listening to my opening statement. Uh, I would love to know if you think that intelligent design is a scientific concept or not. Let me know down below. What did you think of my opening statement? Again, during the actual debate, it was really rough, and it, w it was my first in-person debate, so I was incredibly nervous. I had a lot of like stage fright kind of stuff going on, but I loosened up during the rest of the debate. I hope that you'll watch it whenever I can release it here on my channel, and uh, until then, y'all just need to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.